Lord, we need your help this weekend. Lord, many studies can make us weary. Many studies, Lord, can, instead of uplifting us, Lord, can just confuse us. I just pray that somehow, Father, that we will get our own revelation. Despite what I say, I pray that you will speak through the Holy Ghost in us to each one of us. Lord, we're all in different situations. We've probably got all different doctrines and backgrounds. But I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to each one of us, that we won't be robbed by preconceived ideas. Make us open, Lord, and give us truth, whatever is truth that we need to know. Speak to us, Father. I ask it in your name. Amen. So tonight I just want to encourage you that we, we're near the end. I've called this the culmination of all things. I know ministers have been saying it for probably hundreds of years we're in the last days. But I really do believe we're in the last of the last days. I don't apologise for that. I really believe we are. And I think things are moving very quickly. In fact, I think they're quicker than most of you realise. You know, you probably don't do the research I do, but it's quite frightening the way things are escalating. And I just want to encourage you that we could see the culmination of every prophecy in the Bible coming to pass in our lifetime. So let me try and, you know, excite you with that. Uh, let me read some scriptures. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I shall please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. You know, scientifically, I'm an audio engineer, so I can say this, scientifically, every word that's ever been spoken is still alive. It's like ripples in a pool. When you drop a stone in, you see the big ripples and they go right to the side of the pond, don't they? And in theory, they go across the Atlantic. You know, they get so faint you can't measure them. But don't forget my words could go to eternity. The sound waves are there. Maybe in a few years we'll be able to bring back Jesus' words. So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. So every sound wave is still going out into the atmosphere and could be brought back scientifically. Why am I saying that? Because God's word is eternal. If my word's eternal, it's still there somewhere in outer space, every word that's ever been said. What about God's word? Not one jot or tittle will fail till everything is fulfilled. Well, everything's not fulfilled yet. Let's read another scripture, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verse 14. This is Solomon. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. What God does will be forever. What about crossing the Red Sea? That's finished. Isn't it? What about Elijah going up in a chariot? How can that be forever? Whatever God does lasts forever. It shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken away. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now. That which has been is now. This is a riddle, isn't it? What's been? Noah's ark. That which has been is now. You'll have to get outside the box, okay. That's what it says. What's been is now. History is present. Is that what it's saying? I'm not making this up. This is what it says. That which has been, history is now, and that which is to be, hath already been. The future's already happened, and history is now. And God requireth that which is past. Good conundrum, that, isn't it, for a Friday night? What do we make of that? 
Matthew 5. This is exciting, you know, if you can get the concept we're coming to. Matthew 5, 18. Jesus said, don't think I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. What's the law and the prophets? OT. Not over the top, Old Testament. <laughs> Old Testament. Is that right? The law and the prophets is the Old Testament. The first five books, the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets cover all the Old Testament. Jesus says, I've not come to destroy it. How can he do? He was the Old Testament in flesh. The Word made flesh. He said, I've come to show you what the law really meant. You misunderstood it. Jesus was the law in flesh. He kept all the law. God didn't break his father's law. Paul said it's perfect and just and holy. I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Well, that's, that's after the millennium. That's at least a thousand years away, all right. If the millennium's a thousand years, he says till heaven and earth pass. That's at the end of the thousand years, isn't it, when it's destroyed. Not one jot or tittle will pass from the law till everything is fulfilled. Nothing shall pass from the law till everything's been fulfilled. I thought we'd finish with the law. But he said, no, it's carrying on. Jesus was the law in flesh and blood. Now it's not written on stones, it's written on our hearts. Didn't Jesus say, I'll write the law in your hearts. So I'm carrying the law about in my heart. Thou shalt not kill is written on my heart. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's in my psyche. Isn't it with you? I don't need a, a tablets of stone. I don't need somebody to read the riot at Morris. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. To be honest, because God's in my life, I don't want to do it. I'm embarrassed when I lust. I'm embarrassed when I get proud. I'm embarrassed when I get angry because I don't want to. I'm not trying to justify it. I don't want to do it. And when I do it, I laugh and think, there I go again. Thank God for the blood. I can't be condemned, can I? I'm unreprovable, unrebukable. The sin problem has been dealt with. I'm not worried about the sin. I'm just sad that I'm not like Jesus yet. So I believe in the last days we're going to see the culmination of every prophecy since Adam. Because it's not been fulfilled yet. It's cyclic. Prophecy never gets fulfilled till heaven and earth pass. Not one prophecy is fulfilled in its entirety. We see it, we say, oh, well, that was fulfilled at there and that was fulfilled. Yes, it was, but it'll be fulfilled again in the last days. In the last days, I believe every single prophecy will have its final fulfilment. The whole prophecies of everything in the Bible. Don't forget, Elijah's got to come back again. He came back as the, the spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist. There's the cycle. And Jesus said, yes, it was John the Baptist that was the spirit of Elijah. And he's going to come again. Didn't we just sing it? These are the days of Elijah. What are you singing that for if you don't believe he'll come again? The days of Elijah was 400 years before Jesus. What are you singing a silly song like that for? These are the days of Ezekiel. Do you know what you're singing? How can be the days of Ezekiel? He was years... He was in the captivity. How could these be the days of Ezekiel? That's why, that's why you, Jody says, shall we sing this song? I says, yeah, dead right. People don't know what they're singing, but actually it's prophecy being fulfilled again. Elijah's got to come again and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, lest he smites the earth with a curse. John the Baptist has got to preach again. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He only, he only fulfilled half his message because what did John say? He's coming and he's like a refiner's fire and he'll thoroughly purge his floor. Did Jesus do that? No. He went as a lamb to the slaughter. But the, the prophecy, often in the same verse, is to do with the first and the second coming, which hasn't happened. And Jesus is going to come and purge his floor, gather the wheat into the garner and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's not happened yet. John preached it and only part of it happened and part will happen again. Can you see that every prophecy from Adam is going to be, could happen in your lifetime if you've got eyes to see it? I think that's exciting. Noah's Ark, 
The lion's den. It's all got to happen again. It keeps happening. But in the end, it's a culmination of everything. There's going to be a big explosion. It'll happen so fast, you won't be able to keep up with it, what's happening. You think, well, there's lion's den, and there's Noah's Ark, and there's... They're all prophecies to tell you what will happen in the final one. Don't forget the whole studies I'm doing are about God's plan of love, well, romance and love and family life. That's what God is about. God's not about forgiving sins. God forgave sin to get a clean woman, a virgin, so his son could have a wife. That's why he cleaned up the whore. Because he wants a good wife for his son. And when heaven and earth pass away, Israel, God's wife, will be restored back. She's playing the whore at the moment. Israel is still backslidden. Secular nation will look at it. The Zionists are in the occult. I, I'm, I'm going to show you that Israel are backslidden at the moment. They're God's people for sure, but they've not accepted the Messiah. They've still got the blindfold on. We need to pray for them, don't we? There's, there's the remnant... I'm talking about the nation, the secular nation of Israel. And then Jesus will get his bride and we'll all live happily ever after. It's all about family life. God is a family man. And his whole plan of creation and sin and redemption is to show his love. And if it wasn't, it's a sordid experiment. Because millions will end up in the lake of fire according to your doctrine. So God's a pretty awful, sordid God. Why worship a God when millions go to hell unless it was worth it for love? Love is worth every price. Love is worth everything. And if you take love out of your marriage, if you take love out of your business, if you take love out of your church, if you take love out of everything, you've got a boring, pedantic horrible life haven't you there's no reason to live without love well my husband's left me well thank god you've got children who still love you thank you thank god your boss at work loves you even though your husband's left you you need love somewhere people who say well i don't need anyone they're stupid of course they need somebody the quicker they admit it the better we all need love and if you don't need people i remember a, a man and he said i'd rather have a dog than a woman Women let you down, they're all whores. That's what he thought. That was his opinion. Dogs are more faithful than women. They, they'll, they'll sit well and die for your dog. And he believed it, he loved an animal. Some people love alcohol more than people. Some people love a house more than people. You've got to love. You can't not love. If you hate everyone in the world, you'll love yourself. We're made to love, you can't not love. The quicker we understand that God is a God of love, and everything he does is motivated by love. And everything you don't do, everything you do that's not motivated by love is sin. All sin is a lack of love. Because if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And sin is a transgression of the law. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. So we're coming to the end. You know the romantic stories, don't you? The man courts the woman and then something happens and she goes away and when she's away she meets another man and he's there and he doesn't know and there's all the tension. And in the end, he rescues the woman. They ride off into the sunset, they all live happily ever after. I like romantic films, don't you? I like them, I don't mind the end, it's a little tear comes down my face, that's all right. Shows I'm human. After all the tension and his, you know, and then in the end she comes back to a lover and it, they all end happily ever after. Of course we like, there's something wrong if you don't like romance. Examine yourself why you don't. You're frightened of something, because God's romantic. Why am I saying this? Because in the end, when things are at the worst and you think, oh, this is the end, then he comes and rescues her. And that's what's going to happen. When the devil, the dragon, has got this world in a mess and the Antichrist there and everyone's worshipping the Antichrist and the Antichrist thinks, I'll destroy the bride and I'll kill every Christian and Jew and all God's people, then Jesus will come on his horse, the knight in shining armour. 
Is that right? With the armies of heaven, and he'll rescue the world and kill the dragon, and we'll all live happily ever after. This is what the plan's about. It's exciting. And things are coming to the worst. So don't moan. Don't moan about the state of the world. You're a Christian. Don't moan. Don't moan about the drugs. Don't moan about the sexual perversion. Don't moan about the one world system. Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. This is the time we should get excited. When all the world, when the economic collapse gets worse, which it will, and the whole world's in a mess and everyone's panicking, wants to commit suicide, they'll wonder why we've got a big silly Cheshire cat grin on our face. They say, what have you got to laugh about? Everything. Amen. This is what I've been waiting for. Amen. What, the collapse? Yeah. Jesus is coming soon. Yes. And what the silly politicians promised you we'll get it's going to come and it's going to be the world's bloodiest coup and Jesus is going to take over this planet and then you'll be safe then you won't need to lock your doors and he'll reign in peace it'll be fantastic won't it we should get excited don't moan about it don't fight it don't fight God it's all right no didn't fight the rain coming did he think about it did he fight the rain coming no, he preached righteousness and got in the ark when God told him. Did Lot preach against the fire? No, he just got out. It's time to come out of the world and get ready for the rapture. So it's going to end. We're getting at the end of God's week, aren't we? God's Sabbath. Seventh day, the 7,000 years, Jesus is going to rest. God rested on the Sabbath. I'm going to talk about the Sabbath tomorrow. The Sabbath is God's Sabbath. Did you know that? Because it was God's rest. God worked and rested from all his labours. It's not the Jewish Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. He asked you to keep his Sabbath. It clearly says, keep my Sabbaths, not your Sabbaths. Because God rested and made it a separate day. God did it before he created humans. Well, it, it did made them in the, the six days, but you understand before ever... The population had gone. He rested from all his labours on the seventh day. So the eighth day will start the new heaven and the new earth, won't it? The eighth day is a resurrection, the end. 1 Corinthians. You know, It's quite a fearful thing to talk about the last days isn't it, as a preacher. If any of you are preachers, I know some who won't preach about the last days. I know pastors, they say, I won't preach on the book of Revelation. I say, why not? Too controversial. What they mean is they don't understand it. <coughs> if you understood it, you want to preach it. Is that right? So if you say it's too controversial, you mean they haven't sussed it out yet. Best to be honest, they have not the foggiest what it's about. Don't say it's too controversial. It's not if you know. So I, I don't claim anything. Who am I to, to preach about revelation? But I can. Let, let, let me read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. We know in part, so I'm safe. I'm not claiming I know it all. What I lack, you may know. You may fill in what I lack. And you may be able to put me right after the conference. And that's okay because I know in part. Is that all right? Yeah. I don't know it all. So don't say, oh, Morris, you've got that bit wrong. Maybe I have. Maybe I only know a part. All right. I accept the part that fits with you. And if there's a bit that I say, get that part off somebody else. But let's not fall out about it because we only know in part. A man who claims he's got all revelation all sussed yeah. out is deluded. Yeah. Because we know in part. That's not a cop-out. I don't know about grace in part and salvation. I know 100% it's there. But we're talking about the future. Redemption's the past. I know about that. I'm talking about the future. We know the future in part. Why? Because he said, we look through a glass dimly. Now, when you look through a dim glass, a, let's say a dirty glass, a dirty window, it's not that you can't see, but you can't see the details. Is that right? When you look through a dim glass, you see it, 
You can see the whole picture, but you, you can say, well, I can make out from the shape that's a woman, or from the shape that's a man. But you wouldn't see what colour her earrings were, or the colour of the buttons on her dress, because it's, it's misty. But it's not that you can't see the big picture, you just can't see the details, okay. So what I'm saying this weekend, because I'm talking about the last days and things that could be controversial, I'm looking through a mist, okay, and so are you, so are you. So let, let's compare notes and see if we can help each other. Many things I know for sure, I, I know about creation made in seven days. I know about God calling Abram, I've no doubts about that. I know the law of Moses, it's written. I know about salvation, Jesus died for our sins. There's no compromise there. It's not a, well, I hope so, or it's, I'm looking through a glass darkly. I know. I know about salvation. I'm going to heaven. Are you? I may not know all about the details of heaven, but I know about my eternal destiny. Because the Bible makes some things very, very clear. So let's not compromise on grace and those things that we know. The foundations, as Paul said. But I'm not talking about foundations now. I have been in the past conferences, but I have to say to you now, these are not foundations. We're looking to the future, which is through a mist. Okay. So don't get hung up. Don't come and tell me I'm wrong. Tell me what's right. Come and say, have you thought of this? Modest? Have you thought of that? Let's build one another up. That's what I'm saying. I don't want this conference to be a doctrinal debates all weekend. Do you understand? Let's bring our contributions and help one another rather than criticise. Uh, I want truth. I, I want, you know, areas that I don't know about. Let me give you an example. There's people who believe that the book of Revelation has, has finished. They have a name for it, it doesn't matter. But they doctrinally believe that everything that happened in Revelation happened, you know, in the early church. And, and yes, it did in part, because prophecy keeps getting fulfilled. Matthew 24, let, let's look at what Jesus said about the last days. Verse 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, when will all these things be and what's the sign of your coming? So they're asking about the last days. And Jesus says many things. And uh, some of them could have happened. Uh, verse 15, but he says, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let him who readeth understand. Well, that, that's taken from Daniel. Have a look at it, just so you know. He's quoting Daniel. He says, when you see this prophecy of Daniel, you'll know it's happening. It's in Daniel eleven thirty one. He's talking about uh, an arms... 31, and arms shall stand on his part, this is this man, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And so people have said, well, that's been fulfilled. If you know history, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, 167 BC, he desecrated the temple, didn't he? We know that, did he put a pig in the temple and, and desecrated it? So they said that was the abomination of desolations. Of course it was, in part. You see, it keeps happening. And in uh, AD 70, Titus came, he ransacked Jerusalem, didn't he? And one stone didn't land upon another. So you, we could say, well, it's all happened. Yes, but it's going to happen again. Antiochus Epiphanes did not make a covenant with Israel for seven years which Daniel says he will, he make a covenant for seven years. Well, that's not happened. That's going to happen pretty soon. Where they're going to make a covenant, the man of peace will make a covenant with Israel for seven years. And then break it, won't you, after three and a half years. I believe that's when the bride will go up at three and a half years and the devil comes down and enters the man of sin. Then we'll get the, the worst great tribulation. So can you see that although people claim it happened, there's little bits that won't fit, like making a covenant with Israel for seven years. So we've got to be careful. It's going to happen again. The temple is being prepared to rebuilt, isn't it? 
If you could, you know, you're interested in Israel, they're planning to, they've got these red heifers and they're getting these stones ready to build the temple for the Antichrist to come and set up the, after three and a half years, to set up the abomination. The angel said when Jesus came the first time, peace on earth, goodwill to men, and he didn't bring it. Jesus didn't bring peace on earth, did he? He brought peace in our hearts, but not to earth. There's been more war since Jesus died than from Adam to Jesus. But he will bring peace the second time. And you see how the first and second coming are often even in the same verse. When Abram sacrificed his son, surely it was a prophecy that one day God would sacrifice Jesus. Surely we don't doubt that. See, it keeps happening. And I believe now it's a culmination that everything from Genesis will be again fulfilled. Everything. Maybe that's a bold claim. What was the first miracle Jesus did? Water into wine, wasn't it? That's a strange miracle to do, don't you think? Why didn't he heal somebody? I mean, he made wine to make them all merry at the wedding. I'm not saying they all got drunk, but he made them merry. That's what wine's for, to make the heart glad. So he made wine for them. That's a strange first miracle. It didn't heal anyone. Surely he should have done a healing or a, a compassionate move. Why go to a wedding and turn water into wine? It was very important. He was making a statement, wasn't he? He was prophesying, wasn't he? Did everything that Jesus do prophesy something? What was he doing? He said, look, I'm coming again next time. I'm coming for the marriage feast. Yes. That's why I'm doing the first miracle, because I'm prophesying the first thing I'll do when I get my bride is the wedding. This is why I've come to earth, to get my bride. Jesus didn't come to save the world. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Jesus came to purchase his bride. Before he died, he said, Father, I'm not praying for the world. His blood was shed for the world because his father paid the price. The father gave the son. Jesus was the obedient servant. It wasn't Jesus' plan. It was the willing Isaac. God spoke to Abram. Isaac didn't say, D Dad, I think you should kill me and, and sacrifice and please God. Jesus said, I'm not praying for the world, I'm praying for these that you've given me. I'm praying for my bride because I'm going away. But Father, keep her faithful. And he taught, his love talk, marriage talk. He says, so that I'm in them and them in me and we become one. Isn't that marriage? I in you and you in me that we want. He said, Father, that's what I'm praying for. I'm leaving them, but keep them through your word. Jesus is asking his father to keep his bride, keep them through your word. I've, I've kept them. I've lost none of them except Judas, who was ordained. Will you keep them, Father, till I come back again? Don't let me lose the bride. What was the, one of the last things Jesus did? Was it to whip them out of the temple? One of the last things he did. He went to the temple just before he died, and he whipped them out of the temple. Why was that the last act? The only act of violence that Jesus did. You accept it was an act of violence, don't you? Physical violence. He turned the tables over. You can't turn them over gently, can you? You don't blow them. He turned them over and it said the money went scattering, the doves went. And he got a whip. He made a whip. Is that right? And chased them out of the temple. I'll tell you what, you've got to be strong to get trading Jews to go. <laughs> I'm telling you, when they're dealing, it don't go easily. Especially the money changers, I'll tell you. You try and shift the money changers. They rule the world. The money changers rule the world. Governments don't run countries. Money changers run the world. I'm going to bring you some facts tomorrow. Money changers control the world. They always have from Julius Caesar. And Jesus dealt with the money changers. That's what he did. He took them out. And when Jesus comes back to earth, that's what he's going to do. Cleanse the temple and deal with the money changers. Those that call themselves Jews but are of the synagogue of Satan. He's going to come and deal with them. And he's going to purge, isn't he? 
That's why he did a violent act. It was nothing to do with his first coming. Because he didn't come to do violence and upset people in that way. He come to die. But before he went, he says, when I come back, I'm just warning you. I'm not coming back as gentle Jesus. I'm coming back with a whip. Is that right? Can you see how everything Jesus did, every miracle was a prophecy. It's got to happen. The turning water into wine has got to happen. The marriage feast. The throwing them out of the temple. He whom you look for will come suddenly to his temple. Malachi is that. It's off the top of my head. I think it's Malachi. But he whom you look will come suddenly to his temple. And he'll purge it. Purge it. So, I think I'll finish. Just something for you to think about. I said every prophecy since Adam. That's, that's a bold statement, is it will happen again. Well, isn't it funny that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about Jesus coming again? Enoch, that's right at the beginning, isn't it? Doesn't, doesn't Jude say, even Enoch prophesied the return of Jesus with his saints to judge the earth? Behold, he cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Enoch prophesied it. And he didn't only prophesy it, he prophesied it by being translated. Didn't he? Did he prophesy the rapture or whatever you call it, the catching up? Didn't Adam, who sinned willingly, so as not to lose his wife, didn't he prophesy about Jesus? Willingly taking our sin to purchase his bride. Wasn't Adam and Eve a prophecy? Wasn't Adam put to sleep so Eve could come out? And so they could be brought together? Wasn't Jesus died so we could come out? So one day we'll be brought back together and we have a great consummation? That's Adam and Eve prophesying the, the consummation of all things. Can you see how it's all... Adam and Eve's got to happen again with Christ and the church. We've got to be taken out, haven't we? Because he's now got the new body. So we've got to be taken out of this world and get the new body and then we can come together with Christ and truly become one. I and my wife don't become one. Physically, we join together in holy matrimony. Physical things cannot become one, can they? But we can be joined together. You can be one in spirit. The trouble is you get as close as you can in the flesh and all you are is join, you not become one. But spirit can become one in spirit. When you've got a spiritual body, you can walk through a wall. I can walk into my wife. Well, actually, I've been a woman and walk into my husband. It'll be Jesus. We're the bride of Christ. Do you understand? They can merge, can't they, spirits? This is only a prophecy. The Bible says that marriage is a prophecy. It's not the real thing. There'll be no marriage in heaven. Don't get too hung up about your marriage. It's wonderful. Well, it's either heaven or hell. <laughs> it's not a good thing marriage is either bliss and a taste of heaven and a prophecy of what it'll be like to be married to Christ or else it's hell on earth <laughs> am I right? Yeah. if you're married to the wrong woman it's hell it is there's nothing worse to be married to the wrong woman to be unhappy and tied is hell it's a taste of hell because you're trapped you can never get out do you understand, especially when you're a Christian? Because it's not an option really, is it? Divorce, I know things happen, but it's not really what God wanted, is it? No. You're trapped. But really it should be a taste of heaven, isn't it? Sad that the devil's got this world in such a mess. I get so mad at him, do you? The way he smashes family life up and marriages. And Some of you have been through terrible pains with your marriages and some of you have got no husbands and wife and that shouldn't be, should it? It's because of sin in the world, I understand. But the pain we've been through. But it's only a prophecy. If my wife dies, you know, I suppose I'll be sad. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be sad. Because I, I don't think I could replace her. To be honest, I've lived with her too long, I've loved her too much. I honestly don't think I could find another woman on the planet that could replace her. That doesn't mean I wouldn't find one, I don't know, but I don't think I could, to be honest. But in one way, I, I don't know about you, I'm, I've got past my feelings. 
As a Christian, you can't go on feelings, you know, can you? I honestly, I've already lost it. If God takes her tonight, God forbid, and I'll cry and I'll probably never love another woman like her. But you know, it's only temporal. I'll say, God, you give me 20 years of bliss. I was married 20 years to the wrong woman and that wasn't nice. And she was a good woman. I just picked the wrong woman and I paid for it. So I know what it's like to get the right woman. But you know, it was only temporary. It's no point saying, oh, well, I'll see her in heaven. I won't see her in heaven. She won't be my wife in heaven, you know. Don't get too sentimental. She won't be a wife in heaven. She won't be a husband. There's no sex in heaven. It's not like that. I know if you're carnally minded, you think, well, I don't want to go to heaven if there's no sex. I understand that. I understand that. I can understand that. It's, it's because these are our values, you see. But, you know, if you're spiritually minded, to be one with Christ far outweighs anything. Far outweighs anything, you know. Get your eyes on that if you're divorced, if you're unhappy. Get your eyes on that. This is just temporary. And we'll all be the bride of Christ. I've got to learn to think like a woman because when I face Christ, he'll be my husband. That's hard for a man. Men don't know how to cry, how to be sentimental. We pretend we're tough. Aren't we stupid men? We're soft inside, we're only little boys. Got a bit bigger. We still have our toys, they're just different ones. Instead of dinky toys, they're Jaguars. But they're just toys, aren't they? They're just toys. We still dress up and play cowboys and Indians in our mind, don't we? We still like watching gangsters and bank robbers on the telly. Instead of doing it with our kids, <laughs> shooting y'all. We're a bit, we was too embarrassed to do that, so we watched Sal Capone on television doing it. And we role play that, we're still boys. But oh, to be married to Christ. If this weekend you can get away from the carnality, and, and it's wonderful. Food's wonderful. Marriage is wonderful. They're all wonderful. But compared with what's ahead of us, honestly, if you can catch it, You'll sail through your problems. You'll sail through your difficulties. You'll sail through your sickness. You'll sail through your sorrow. You will, you know. Get your eyes off this stinking old world. It's coming to an end. Amen. Look up. The redemption's coming, honestly. I, I'm not really worried now if I lose everything. The house burns down. God takes my wife and family. It's of no consequence. Because the end's coming. Jesus is coming. And I'm going to get a new body. Just think of that. I won't be a midget anymore. <laughs> and I'll be able to hear perfectly. And I won't be binoculars. The bride will be beautiful, you know, would be wonderful. Be wonderful. So let me finish there. So this weekend we'll, we'll look at these, we'll pick up where we last with the early church. We'll see how far we get. So I'm not going to try and fit in all the details, okay. If I hold it on something, okay. But I, I'm not claiming I know everything. So let, let's just enjoy the weekend's fellowship together. Let's enjoy the teaching. See if we can learn, all right. Lord, please help us. Lord, I'm desperate that people understand about your plan of romance and love and family life. Lord, it, it alters everything about us, Lord. It'll alter our relationship with our wives and our families. It'll alter our relationships if we have no families. It'll alter our relationships at work, with politics, with finance. Lord, it'll, it'll alter everything. Our mind will be renewed if we can get our mind looking at the future, these exciting things that are coming, these fearful things that are coming on the earth. Oh Lord, please help us this weekend to get a new glimpse through this dark, misty glass. Let's see a little bit of revelation, a bit of light. Something that can excite us and motivate us. Don't let us leave this conference the same, Father. And Lord, bless us as we have fellowship now. Give us peaceful sleep, Lord. Give us revelation in the night. Visions and dreams and let it be a wonderful Holy Ghost weekend, Father. We ask it in your name. Amen.